On their expedition, the two stumbled across various cabins where they would break in and either camp out for a while or just completely ransack the place. As in most cases, the owners of these cabins were long gone for the winter due to the inclement weather of the area. Though this wasn't true for everyone, as during the same time, the Tita family, consisting of Father Rolf, his wife Kay, and their two children, Lene and Trish, along with their 76-year-old grandmother, Bath Potts, had been staying in their cabin to celebrate Christmas together. And so, on the morning of the 22nd, the family would go into nearby Salt Lake City to finish off the last of their Christmas shopping, leaving the cabin unattended at the exact same time that Vaughn and Edward happened to be strolling through the area. Upon breaking in, the two quickly recognized that whoever was living there had only just momentarily stepped away and would be returning at the very latest by Christmas, as evidenced by the gifts sitting under the tree. And finding their first real opportunity to carry out their intended goal of murder, the two hunkered down and waited for the family to arrive back home. While hiding out, it's unknown what exactly the two had done to pass the time, except for a brief few minutes in which Edward would pick up the family's VHS camera and record Vaughn as he tore into the family's gifts. The added context makes this video all the more disturbing, as Vaughn was opening gifts belonging to the family that they were waiting to kill. And it's made all the more chilling when you notice that Vaughn is carrying a gun, along with the moment that he says Lene Tita's name as he reads it on the gift wrapping. And worst of all is that the gravity of the situation they were currently in clearly had no impact on these two men as they were completely emotionless. And unsurprisingly, things only get darker from here as after a few hours, Beth, Kay, and Lene would pull into the driveway. Upon entering the house, the pair of men would immediately point their guns at the family and start making demands, to which Lene responded by praying to God that her and her family be spared, which was of no use, as Edward turned to her and claimed that her prayers wouldn't work, as he only worshipped the devil. And moments later, the two would grab her mother and grandmother and end their lives for no apparent reason. This left only 20-year-old Lene, who tried desperately to convince the men to leave, knowing in the back of her mind that her father Rolf and sister Trish would be arriving soon. But it was to no avail, as her pleading was interrupted by the sound of another snowmobile pulling into the driveway. Upon exiting their vehicle, both Trish and Rolf would be held at gunpoint, with Rolf being told to strip his clothes and give up all his money. Again, pleas were made to just take anything and leave them alone, but the two men remained unfazed. They wanted to cause pain and anguish to anyone and everyone, and nothing was going to stop them. And so, Vaughn pointed his gun at Rolf and pulled the trigger, striking the man in the face before delivering one final blow to the back of his head leaving just the two daughters. Having thoroughly decimated what just an hour before was a happy, healthy family, Vaughn and Edward would cover Rolf and the cabin in gasoline and set them on fire, before hijacking the snowmobiles with the two remaining daughters and driving away down the hill to a nearby road. However, they weren't alone. On their way out, the kidnappers and their victims would notice a man waving to them in the distance, with the individual being Randy Zorn, their uncle, who recognized the two girls and attempted to flag them down. However, knowing that had they acknowledged their relationship, it would almost certainly get the man killed, they chose to ignore him and told the kidnappers that they had no idea who he was. Sensing something was off, Randy would follow the group down the mountain where the men were now loading into the family's car. He waved to them once more, this time yelling at the group to stop and even running after them. But again, the girls pretended not to know them sacrificing a chance at being saved in order to protect their uncle. Confused by this bizarre encounter and apparent urgency from the girls, Randy began to fear that something Sorry. bad had happened at the family cabin, which was only confirmed when he heard another snowmobile tearing down the mountain. On it was a barely clothed Rolf, who despite being shot in the head twice, set on fire, and his eyes being almost completely swollen shut, was somehow alive and had managed to get on a snowmobile to find help. And it what was there the that he told Randy, I've been shot, my wife has been killed, and my daughters have been kidnapped. Something that most likely saved the lives of those two girls. 
As the police were contacted and were able to quickly track down the vehicle, where the kidnappers would accidentally run it right off the road, flipping it over multiple times before crashing into a ravine. Quite shockingly, no one would be badly injured in the wreck, and following a brief shootout, Vaughn and Edward gave in and were swiftly arrested, bringing this whole nightmare to an end. When the dust eventually settled, Edward would end up receiving life in prison, while Vaughn, the man shown here opening the family's gifts, was sentenced to death, with both men reportedly being visibly shocked at the sight of Rolf when he showed up to court to testify against them. Rolf would later go on to make a full recovery, which definitely ends the story off on an empowering note, though the carnage left behind by these two men in the moments following this video. Chap. I don't mean to be weird. What did they, what did they shoot him with? Because two bullets to the head. On to make a full recovery, which definitely ends the story off on an empowering note. Though the carnage left behind by these two men in the moments following this video, I think it's twenty-two. It yeah, that's what I thought. One of the darkest on the site. It's very rare. Yeah, it's very rare, but. Okay, listen, I don't need to be knowledgeable of anything, but I saw a video about like the, the, the autonomy of a headshot, whatever. That, remember Chad, the video that we watched? Why well, I watched on my own? And, I, and, and, and whatnot. Right? And also, like, when people suffer headshots, what happens to them, whatever. Remember these two videos? And they're both really, really good videos. And it's like, it. Yeah. And being able to do all that with two headshots is pretty dank. Before we get into our next case, I want to first thank BetterHelp for sponsoring the video. The anatomy. I gotta keep watching the southwest side. It's where most of them come from. You think it's likely? No. The odds are way against it, even in weather like this. But there's always a chance. The day was already off to a terrifying start. As hail began to fall from the sky and the sun became completely concealed by the dark clouds forming overhead. This was nothing out of the ordinary for the area though, as Joplin, Missouri is and has been notorious for its consistent threat of massive tornadoes. And so, despite the fear of an impending tornado looming in the area, many just continued about their normal lives, okay, including a select few who even showed up for school, like Will Norton. The then 16-year-old had been attending Joplin High School, which he was headed for that very day to attend an early morning tennis practice, only to be met by those extreme conditions, with Will later going on to describe the harrowing events of that day in a YouTube video titled, I Nearly Died. So I get ready really fast and I rush to school, out the door, and then I'm leaving for school and there is just tons of rain. And the wind is so crazy. You just see water. It's like horizontal rain and all the cars are like veering. I was having trouble keeping my car on the road. I drive a Hummer. This should not be happening. Anyway, I made it uh, to home and I think I'm just going to go take a nap for the rest of my life because I didn't die. I, oh my gosh, my, yeah, I'm done. The video was posted to his YouTube channel called Will the Beast 8888 where he had found genuine success in the early days of YouTube, becoming a pioneer on what was then a brand new space, long before YouTubers were ever actually a thing. But throughout his entire channel, this upload was by far the most chilling, not just due to the brush with death he experienced that day, but because of the events that would unfold just two years following its release. The date was May 2nd, 2011, but for students of Joplin High School, they simply referred to it as Graduation Day, the day in which Will and his classmates would walk the stage into the next chapter of their lives. It was an event that Will and his family watched excitedly from the crowd before the moment was interrupted by the ringing of a tornado siren. These sirens lasted only around 30 seconds, leaving many unfazed as they were practically a daily routine in the area, given just how common severe weather was. And with no further alerts coming through their phones, aside from a standard warning, letting them know that conditions were ripe for a tornado, things continued on as normal from there. With the rain now starting to fall, Will's sister, Sarah, along with their mother and grandmother, chose to hop in the car and head home in order to get a head start on preparation for the night's graduation party, leaving Will and his father around 20 minutes behind, with Will driving the two home in his beloved Hummer, which he had mentioned often across his channel. 
And with that, the family was split up into two cars, one that at this point was almost home, and another that was just beginning their route, which is when things began to get more worrisome. Suddenly, the rain fell even harder, and the winds began blowing horizontally, to the point that trees were starting to bend over and eventually break due to the strain. Recognizing the worsening conditions, Mark would call Sarah, who had just arrived at home, to ask her to open the garage for them so they can pull right in and avoid having to get out in this worsening weather. A request that couldn't be completed, as right after their phone call, the power would suddenly shut off, rendering the door impossible to open. And so, Sarah called back with the update to let the two know that they would likely have to park outside and make a run for it through the front door. Though by this point, the sound of wind was nearly deafening over the phone, and despite repeatedly asking, Dad, where are you? All she could hear was wind, until the sound was broken by her father yelling, Will, pull over. There's the tornado. Pull over. From the KSN Storm Center, this is a severe weather alert. Good evening. Uh, we're back. We've got some uh, information on this Hello. one. Let's go ahead and go to the Freeman First Alert Doppler radar. Train no responders in Galena are reporting now sightings of started? funnel clouds going off in Joplin. Those are definitely that power like flashes minutes, that right? we're seeing on the ground. No. Uh, have a Folks, tornado on the ground. This is a tornado. Yeah, this is a very dangerous situation. Oh, we cannot stress this enough. If you are in Joplin, please take cover. No, it is certainly going off. Caitlin, I'm just looking out the door right now. Please do not go outside. Towering in front of Will and his father was a massive one mile wide Three tornado. Three minutes, with winds guys. gusting yeah, around 50 miles per hour. It was an EF5, the highest ranking a tornado can achieve. And now, Will and Mark were directly in its path. Suddenly, all Sarah could hear over the phone was the sound of crashing and destruction. Before, the call would be dropped. In that very moment, the tornado would come in direct contact with the Hummer, causing it to flip in the air multiple times. And despite Mark desperately holding on to his son, Will would slip through his father's arms and be sucked out of the car's sunroof. Huh? Somehow, Mark would manage to survive the direct hit of the tornado, but so many others were not as lucky, as the disaster would leave a staggering 158 people dead, including Will, who despite being missing for days, would be found at the bottom of a nearby pond days later. The story alone is incredibly grim, but it's made all the more disturbing by the video posted two years before, which now features so many chilling moments of foreshadowing. I'd pull over into the... Jesus Christ, uh, guys, uh, pull up, pull up chat. I'm just inviting him to the party, otherwise we're not. Chat, we're not gonna make it to the event. You guys, join my lobby fast. Go. Fast, yeah, fast, 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 boss. Both, both. Made it. Now we can finish the video. The big puddles, oh, and I was shit. like, oh. Keep in mind, I drive a Hummer, so really, I shouldn't have any reason to be scared. Anyway. I made it safely home, and I think I'm just gonna go take a nap for the rest of my life. I'm done. I am done. I'm never driving in weather again, ever. Bye, guys. But although this certainly classifies as one of the darker videos on the site, the Norton family has turned this tragedy into something positive and celebrates his life as opposed to focusing on his tragic passing, with Sarah herself even bravely coming forward and releasing a video outlining her entire story of that day. He's in a good place. It's just hard on us who are left here dealing with all of it, but um, it's okay. He's just in the best place ever. So, yeah, that's something to be happy about. He wouldn't want us to be sad. The time is getting closer and closer. The seconds are ticking. Excitement is... Whatever. He wouldn't want us to be sad. Thanks Kicking. mods for fixing Expect the Dono panel link that I mentioned earlier. Hong Kong's XQCL. Real American values come from Tap. We'll finish it. It was said to be the party of the year. So a celebration to so say down. goodbye so to 2008 so and hello to a brand new promising year. It was New Year's Eve, the day where everyone is looking for a fun party to attend. 
and in Bangkok, Thailand, the Santika Club was the place to be. The event was dubbed Goodbye Santika, hitting on the theme of leaving the past behind and starting fresh in this new year. And in preparation, promotional commercials would be shot and aired all throughout the region, building up even more hype for the much anticipated event. Goodbye, simply dad. It promised to be their best show yet, with live music from numerous well-known artists and, of course, lots and lots of alcohol. And sure enough, as New Year's Eve rolled around, this hype would translate into a large crowd swarming the doors to be part of this special occasion. And as the clock ticked closer and closer to midnight, the crowd only continued to grow, with it being estimated that as many as 1,000 people were in attendance. At this point, very few videos exist from this night, Though in the time since, three key clips have come forward that piece together the events which transpired once the crowd had gathered. At 11.44 p.m., with the big day only minutes away, this video was taken up close to the stage, showing not only the high energy of the night, but also the mass of people crammed into this venue. It truly was the place to be, the kind of party that so many would have loved to be part of. But this wasn't even the main event. Midnight was fast approaching and the owner of the club had promised a spectacle that the city would never forget. And so an idea was hatched, to give patrons sparklers which would be lit and used during the countdown. <laughs> shuts off after first showing a happy couple celebrating together and then panning to the stage where the performers were hyping up the crowd even more and launching pyrotechnics of their own into the air, adding to the explosive atmosphere within the club. And finally, we have our third and final video, this one having taken place just a few minutes following the cell phone footage, only this time, the cameraman was outside of the venue. No one really knows how it started. Perhaps it was the fireworks launched indoors as part of the performance, or maybe it was the countless sparklers handed out to a sea of drunken people, or potentially it was a combination of both. But regardless, somehow a blaze had erupted, quickly spreading to the club ceiling, where the crowd would actually cheer it on, mistakenly believing that it was part of the event, as at that same exact time, a band just so happened to be performing by the name of Burn. By this point, the performers knew immediately that the fire was unplanned and that an emergency was brewing, and so they slipped off the stage and out the back exit, with no guidance being given to the thousand plus people in the venue, none of whom had realized the danger they were truly in, until the power would shut down, with the inside falling pitch black and silent, save for the crackling of the spreading fire, illuminating the area to avoid but not the area to run to. And suddenly, panic-driven chaos ensued. There were multiple exits, but just too many people, too much darkness, too much smoke. And in the matter of just a few minutes, the fire had consumed every inch of safety within that building. The tales told from within that event are horrid, with some of the most disturbing being not about the crush of humans surging towards the exit, or the unstoppable blaze moving at lightning speed, but instead, about a chandelier. In the video preceding the disaster, we see briefly through the low quality imagery, a chandelier, the club's crown jewel, measuring in at a whopping 10 meters in diameter and weighing over a ton. And while the fire began to spread to the ceiling, it came in contact with the base of this massive artifact, causing it to heat up 
and eventually snap from its support, landing atop of the crowd below and taking the lives of multiple people. When the smoke eventually cleared on the catastrophe and the carnage was fully revealed, it would be announced that 67 people had lost their lives that day, with countless others being burned and permanently disfigured, leading to the club owner being jailed for three years. Despite the true cause still being debated to this day, the video from directly beforehand shows just how lax the safety measures were, as even if they weren't the direct cause, giving sparklers to a thousand drunken people indoors was just a disaster waiting to happen. And in the end, the party truly did live up to its name, Goodbye Santika, as the club was burned past the point of recognition and now sits as dark as the videos surrounding it. Our final video Ouch. is probably one of the most unusual cases that I've come across in quite some time, with that being the story of Akmal Sheikh. Born in Pakistan in 1956, Sheikh had spent the majority of his life unnoticed, spending his days mainly outside of the gaze of the public eye, though that didn't mean his life was uneventful by any means. Over the years, Sheikh would move from country to country starting numerous new businesses, like in the 80s when he moved to the US to become a real estate agent, and then in the 90s when he moved to London to start a mini oh, yeah, business. With the only problem being that none of these ventures ever really stuck, causing him to live in a state of poverty, even at one point going bankrupt following the decline of his cab business. And his failures didn't stop there. As in 2003, Sheikh would be accused of sexual harassment and unfair dismissal of a 24-year-old employee, resulting in his wife taking his kids and filing for a divorce, which would be far from his last legal struggle. In 2005, Sheikh was placed under official investigation following the London bombings, as he was caught sending a text to his friends stating, Now everyone will understand who Muslims are and what jihad is, while at the same time being accused of threatening his ex-wife. Now, none of these claims ever led to any official legal charges, though he would be arrested just months later for driving under the influence. As you can see, Sheikh's life was a roller coaster, and at this point, he was on his largest drop yet, disgraced and living off of handouts and eating out of soup kitchens nearly every night, until the year 2007, when his life would change forever. During a public demonstration that year, Sheikh would be introduced to a man named Gareth Saunders, a musician who had ties all throughout the music industry, including with numerous recording studios in the area. And it was during this chance meeting that Sheikh's life purpose would be discovered. At some point prior, Sheikh, a man with no musical experience whatsoever, had written a song called Come Little Rabbit, which he believed would propel him to worldwide stardom. But it went even deeper than that, as Sheikh was so sure that not only would this song break records and become a global phenomena, huh? but also that it would bring the world together and usher in a new era of peace on Earth. In a sense, he believed that this song could truly save the world. And with this in mind, he began to beg his new acquaintance to help him record the song in a studio, a request that Gareth eventually seemed to accept, as that very same year, Come Little Rabbit would be recorded and released to the public. Come little rabbit, come to me, come little rabbit, let it be. Come little rabbit, come and pray. La 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 Wait, I, As you can wait. probably tell just based on how things are going so far, the song did not perform as intended, and sadly the world did not come together in harmony upon its release, likely because the song just wasn't very good. The sad reality of the situation was that Akmal Sheikh was a very mentally unwell man, and these big dreams that he had throughout his life were, in most cases, more so delusions. And though we don't know for sure what exactly he was suffering from, many close to him described his behavior as being on par with severe bipolar disorder, and Come Little Rabbit was the latest example of his struggling mental state, representing a point in which he detached his furthest from reality, and sadly, 
It was this very song that would drive his life to an even lower point. As the world continued on with its usual chaos after the release of Come Little Rabbit, Shake still believed that it could provide peace on Earth, becoming convinced that the only reason it hadn't worked already was that no one knew who he was. But this was all going to change after he received an opportunity that would shift the course of his life. Around the same time, Shake was introduced to a man named Okol, who had just the opportunity waiting for him. By pure chance, a once-in-a-lifetime performance had opened up in one of China's biggest nightclubs that just so happened to be owned by Okol. And supposedly being impressed by Come Little Rabbit, Okol decided he was going to fly Shake out to China to fill that slot and perform in front of thousands. What? And so on September 12th, 2007, Akmal would be flown to China free of charge to make his dream a reality. But before leaving, Sheikh was given a single suitcase by Akol, which he was told to bring along with him to their destination, since due to a scheduling conflict, Akol had to grab a later flight, leaving Akmal all on his own. By all accounts, the flight there went smoothly, though trouble quickly arose when the plane touched down at Yurimqui Airport in China, as there was one major issue. Sheikh didn't speak the language, and so, once released at the gate, the man had no idea where to go and was unable to communicate with anyone, leading to him pacing around nervously and acting slightly erratic, which didn't go unnoticed by airport security. They watched the man's behavior deteriorate for several minutes before ultimately making the decision to detain him and search his belongings, believing that surely he was up to something suspicious which is when they'd open that very bag given to Akmal by Akol, only to discover a staggering four kilograms C4. of heroin. Oh. The discovery sent Sheikh into a panic, as he was completely unaware that he was transporting illegal contents because the bag didn't even belong to him, stating adamantly that it belonged to his friend Akol, who was flying in on the next flight and would be there soon to help clear oh, things up. sure. And so surprisingly, security seemed to believe him, as they all sat waiting for Akol to step off the next plane and set the entire situation straight, though he never did. In reality, Sheikh had been tricked into becoming a drug mule, taken advantage of with his mental illness used against him to make him commit a crime he had nothing to do with. There was never any club and there was never any performance. It was all just a ruse. And despite the authorities' willingness to wait for the man at first, their patience soon wore thin, and Sheikh was arrested for drug smuggling, with his punishment being death. What? A British man convicted of drug smuggling in China has now been told of his fate. Akmal Sheikh will be executed by firing squad within 24 hours unless the Chinese authorities have mercy on him. His family says he has a history of mental illness and may have been duped into smuggling drugs by traffickers. The decision was extremely controversial all across the world with the backlash leading to the case being heard for a second time in 2009. And despite numerous requests by Sheikh's lawyer to have the man undergo a mental evaluation, as he had been quite clearly taken advantage of, they were rejected. And the initial ruling was upheld, with a date being set for his execution on the 29th of December. 24 hours? Following this shocking decision, the first and one of the only four recordings of Come Little Rabbit would be posted to YouTube, which featured not only the lyrics, but also the sad story of Shake along with it, including a call to the viewers to join the effort in stopping the impending execution as part of a massive final push to change the minds of China's government. <laughs> But it was no use. And on the morning of December 29th, Akmal Sheikh would receive a lethal injection, with China supposedly walking back their plans to execute him via firing squad. Though either way, the man was dead, and his body would never be returned. Wait, what the fuck? Today, the video of Akmal's song and the pleas to save his life remain as a forgotten relic here on YouTube, encapsulating the story of a man whose desire to bring the world together in song was cruelly taken advantage of. And though it was peace that he was so desperately seeking, the song would only lead to his ultimate demise. Come, little rabbit, come to me. 
Um, uh, anyway, um, 